All right. Well, all those things doing its thing, we'll introduce you to the uh, spinal anatomy and physiology first. And we're going to go real deep into physiology because um, it helps us understand um, some of the syndromes that we'll be dealing with and that we may, we may run into. Okay, so uh, right here, the spinal anatomy. Let me just change this. What do we want? What do we, we want a lightsaber, don't we? Yes. What color do you guys want your lightsaber? Purple. Purple it is. All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, I don't know if that's the light or dark side that we're, the mixture of both, right? Yeah. That's the best. Samuel Jackson. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. mixture of both. All right, um, I, it is hard to imagine him as like this, benevolent samurai, you know, <laughs> especially when you see, you know, movies like you know, Jackie Brown and uh, um, Hateful Eight. Anyone seen Pulp Hateful Eight? Pulp Fiction, yeah. He plays a very interesting character. He's a very good character actor. He plays his role. Anyway, that's completely unrelated to what we're <laughs> supposed to talk about here. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the anatomical structures of the spine, and some of this is in your book as well, um, but uh, right up here, what kind of view am I looking at the vertebrae in? Yeah, we're looking at a, a transverse view. So, if, and I've got some models up here as well. Okay, fair enough. So, if we were to take a transverse section through and then just look, basically, I'm looking from the top on top of a vertebrae down onto it. Okay, so imagine that. And if we orient ourselves, um, which I didn't actually write on the notes here, but this part right here is going to be dorsal or posterior, and then this part here is going to be uh, ventral or anterior. Um, so uh, the model here is oriented like this. If that makes sense. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right, so I've got the, the dorsal aspect here, it's there, and then the ventral or anterior aspect here. Okay, just to kind of orient you guys a little bit. Okay, so we look down on the, the vertebrae, and we notice that there are some characteristic uh, structures. So you notice this little thing that sticks out, right? And this is called the spinous process. And we know that uh, ligaments, tendons, muscles attached to those spinous processes. Okay, and we note that these are actually what we feel when we're doing a spinal exam, right? We're feeling those spinous processes, and, and again, here's the model, as they kind of lay um, on top of one another. And they should generally feel like what? When you're doing your assessment, your exam. They should make a, generally make a straight line, right? They should be in line. They should make a straight line right along more or less the midline of the body. Huh? Yeah, and you shouldn't have any motion, right? You should just feel this little bumpy straight line. If you don't, okay, so you have something like this, for example, as you're feeling down, and you feel a discontinuity in that line, um, that, that's vernacularly known as a quote-unquote step-off, right? And that it may indicate something called a subluxation, um, and we'll talk about some of the terminal, the, some of the terms here in a little bit, because this is a terminology-rich um, discussion. All right. Okay, and obviously that tells us that there may be a problem. Right? There may be a problem with the the integrity of the spinal column and possibly the integrity of the spinal cord. Okay. So we got the little process that sticks out. Um, and then you also have a process that runs through the body from left to right. And we call that a transverse process. Okay. And you've got one in each side, one here and one here. So the spinous sticks out, okay, dorsally, and then the transverse transverses or traverses it. Okay. And in this little model you see where I'm pointing here. You see where I'm pointing there? Okay, those are the transverse processes. And again, um, you have ligaments that attach to those, okay, and tendons that go over and uh, go to muscles. All right, you guys cool with that? What else attaches to these? Particularly, well, really the only place we see that is in the thoracic spine. 
The ribs, yes. Your ribs attach to the posterior part, or rather, excuse me, rather the anterior, uh, the um, the uh, ventral part of the spinous process. Okay. So you can see you have the rib here, and see how the rib attaches to the front part here, and it actually attaches at a joint. Okay, that a joint is created there where the rib attaches. And those joints are known as the condyle facets. So you have two general types of joints in your spine. You have the condyle facets, those are where the ribs attach. Okay, so guess what? There is very, very limited motion of your ribs. And you want that, right? Because your rib cage has to expand and, and, and collapse. So you do have motion of the rib. It is not a bone-to-bone -bone attachment at all. It is actually a, a joint there. The other type of facets that you have, okay, are these facets here, and these are called articular facets. And articular facets, and you generally have four of them, two on each side, articular facets are where one vertebrae articulates to another. So you see this little flat area here on this model? A flat area coming out. And right where those vertebrae articulate, okay, those are my articular facets, and they allow for the limited motion that we get with the, the spinal column, right? So with your side to side, your lateral movement, and then flexion and extension. Okay, those are the articular facets articulating. Again, these are our joints. You guys, you guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. And I can pass this around. Let me do. I will. I will hear in just a just a few. Um, and I've got a, a couple of different models here. Okay. So when we look at the at the vertebrae, again, we have the spinous process. We have the transverse processes. We've got our articular and condyle facets. Okay. We have the large, thick area of the vertebrae, which is going to be anterior or ventral, and that's called the body, and that is the thick, bony part. Okay, that's this right here. Okay, what kind of section have I cut? What? Um, sagittal. Yeah, sagittal, right, or mid mid sagittal actually, because it's exactly right along the midline. So I've got the mid sagittal section here that I'm showing you guys. Um, Okay, you guys go with that? This is a lateral view that we're looking at here. And so you've got the body here. All right, you've got your spinous process coming out. You've got your articular facets here where the joints can articulate. And then, in, then, then what separates one body of a vertebrae from the other body of a vertebrae? You have what's known as an intravertebral disc. And the intravertebral discs are pretty easy to appreciate here. You guys can see them. And what is the role of an intravertebral disc? Cushion. Acts as kind of a protection, a cushion, shock absorption, right? Mm -hmm. So where exactly does the spinal cord come into play here? In between, yeah, the foramen. Between what? The in between the body and the spinous process. Excellent, yeah. So it actually is in between the body and the spinous process. And each vertebrae has a hole in it. Okay, there are actually two holes, or, or, or basically three holes that are created. There are holes on the side, okay, as the as the vertebrae come together, and then there's a hole that goes right through the vertebrae, and that hole is just posterior to the body. Okay, and that is known as the vertebral uh, forama, or um, the spinal canal. And that is uh, this structure right here. So does my art more or less orient you guys to what we have on the models here? Does that kind of make sense? Okay, again, it's kind of basic anatomy and physiology. That's all right. Okay, and so then you have the spinal cord that runs through here, and the dotted line is just showing you that the forearm penetrates through um, the vertebrae. And then in these these openings here, we have nerves that come out, right? And these are known as what? These are known as spinal nerves. And everywhere you have, okay, one vertebrae articulating with another vertebrae, you're going to have a set of spinal nerves, right? You're going to have um, 
one on the right and one on the left. Okay, so everywhere you see a hole here, laterally, you're going to have a spinal nerve coming out. You guys okay with that? Now that changes somewhat once we get past the lumbar spine and we go into the sacral, the sacrum, um, because the sacrum is fused vertebrae, right? Everything gets fused, and so you just kind of have this. Um, you still have a bilateral symmetry to it, um, but it is not like the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. You guys okay with that? And then your cosageal vertebrae don't really have a spot. The spinal cord basically terminates at the end of the, of the sacrum there. You guys okay with that? Okay. So that's kind of the basic anatomy. How many vertebrae do we have total? Got 33 total vertebrae. And I just remember 7, 12, 5, 5, 4. Is that kind of how you remember it? 7, 12, 5, 5, 4. So I have 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae. So how many ribs do we have? 12, 12 ribs, all right. Okay, you have how many true, what we call true ribs? 10. And what, what, why, why do they call them true ribs? What makes they, them? They attach to the sternum. Good, they actually attach to the sternum here, okay. And then you've got your two floating ribs here, okay, that come off of what? T11 and T12, right? T11 and T12. Okay, and those are your, your floating ribs. Cool. Easy, right? Now, because the first two vertebrae are very special, so that would be C1 and C2, they have a special name um, because they form a joint that allows you to move your head, right? For allows for lateral movement, extension, and flexion of the head. Okay? And so those two vertebrae are known as the what? God, I can't remember. Yes, they're known as the atlas and the axis, okay? The atlas is C1, the axis is C2, right? And the C1, the atlas, actually articulates with the skull. What bone is that? would that be? What bone would that be? The occipital bone, yeah, right? articulates with the occipital bone, and that allows for extension and flexion, right? And then C1 articulates with C2, and that allows for the lateral movement, and the, right? So you've got your yes, and you've got your no. I just think of that way, your, your yes, yes and no. That makes sense? Okay. You don't have that in most areas of the spine. Your motion is much less limited in the other areas of the spine. So if you had to guess, this area, C1 and C2, tends to be prone to injuries, right? Because there's so much more motion. Um, and that's just kind of the way it is with joints. Any, any, anywhere, the more mobile your joint is, the more um, range of motion you have, the more problems you have, right? So we know, uh, for example, um, your wrist, Okay, is tends to not be as problematic as your shoulder, right? You can break your wrist, and you know you can you can heal up generally pretty well. But if you have major damage to your shoulder joint, there's so much stuff there, um, and all of it's required for stability um, that you can have lots of problems there. Kind of. So it's just kind of a rule of thumb that I think about. Okay, good deal. Now when we look at the disc. The, the discs have two components to them. They have this, this outer fibrous capsule, okay, and that's called the annulus fibrosis, okay, or the annulus. And then within, inside of that capsule, is a kind of a, a gelatinous substance. So it's a shock absorbing substance, and that's known as the nucleus propulsus. And we know occasionally what can happen to this annulus here. It can tear, and then what happens? The nucleus herniates, the contents spill out, okay? And that's what's known as a herniated disc, right? When somebody herniates a disc, that's what happens is the nucleus herniates through a tear in the annulus, okay? And this is a extraordinarily common problem. Um, we think at least 
of the adult population has has this or has had this very high yeah um, there is there's um, uh, you're almost guaranteed if you have an MRI of your spine you're almost guaranteed to find anomalies involving the discs just not to the extent of where it causes physical yeah yeah so most 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 herniations are self-limiting believe it or not most people well, they don't fix themselves, unfortunately. The herniation, yeah, the, it, it doesn't fix itself, but the, the body kind of adapts um, and it can get it can clear some of that material out of the spine and, and people, most people within a few weeks of that injury go on and, and, and do okay. But we know that this is a very common cause of chronic back pain or one of the things associated with chronic, chronic back pain. And this can lead to something known as spinal stenosis. And a spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal here, right? So it narrows. There is another concept known as spondylitis, okay? Spondylitis is inflammation. So stenosis is narrowing, just like valve sten a stenotic valve doesn't move very well, right? And that narrows, basically narrows a passage for blood, to move in now the heart. Well, stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal or the, uh, the uh, foramen. And then spondylitis is inflammation, and together these, um, for, these form the, the basis of it, something known as DJD or degenerative disc disease. I think I wrote that out wrong, huh? De de degenerative disc disease, DDD. Whatever, you guys get that. You guys get that, right? Right. And this is a very common problem, right? De 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 degenerative disc disease is a very, very. I think I, I think I was like degenerative joint disease. I think maybe, but, but anyway, yeah, we're talking disc disease here with. Uh, very common, right? Very common uh, problem. All right, you guys good with that? Okay, so let's look at these vertebrae. So with the cervical vertebrae, what do we need to know? Well, the phrenic nerve, right? The phrenic nerve comes out of it, right? C3 through 5 keeps the diaphragm alive, right? So if you have an injury at or above this, the level of 3, three through 5, that could compromise the phrenic nerve, right? That's your major nerve of breathing. Could be a real big problem. Um, then your thoracic and your lumbar vertebrae, what you want to know here, of course, your sympathetic nervous system comes out of thoracic and lumbar, right? And we know that high thoracic injuries can disconnect the sympathetic nervous system, right? And that means that you have an unopposed parasympathetic nervous system can lead to a certain type of shock we'll talk about a little later on today. You guys, you guys cool with that? All right. Good. And then your sacral and your cosageal um, vertebrae are fused. Okay. You guys, you guys cool with that? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Let's move right along. Okay. So this is where the nuance comes. So what I want to do now is I want to look at the spinal cord itself. Okay. So we take a transverse slice through the spinal cord. And what you notice right away is that there are two general areas of the spinal cord. You have kind of this inner, kind of a butterfly almost looking area, okay? And this inner area is kind of a darker shade. It's kind of a grayish color, and that, of course, is gray matter, okay? And remember, what is gray matter in neurology? Going back to neurology, what is... Myelin sheet. Nope. Nope. Axons are fatty, right? Axons fatty, and fat has kind of a a whitish color, right? So your white matter is actually axons, right? Your white matter are tend, tends to be myelinated axons. So your gray matter is going to be the cell bodies, right? The soma of the neurons, right? So you've got concentrations of cell bodies here toward the center of the spinal cord, and then the axons of the cell bodies are toward the periphery of the spinal column. You guys okay with that? And just to um, orient you, dorsal here and ventral here, okay, so posterior, anterior.
Okay, and some of the um, some of the structures you need to be aware of, of course, the gray matter here and the white matter. Okay, you have a fissure that goes in toward the back. This is called the posterior median fissure. Okay, and then back here, these are known as your posterior white columns. Okay, so again, we're talking about axons. So this, so wherever you see white matter, that's information traveling up or down the cord. And then wherever you see gray matter, that's information processing or integration going on, right? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so that's the dorsal part, okay? And then do you see where the gray matter kind of comes to a kind of comes to a head here? in the back and in the front. You guys see that? These are called horns. And you have in the front here your anterior gray horn. And in the back you have your posterior gray horn. Okay? And those horns are where you kind of have your, um, your roots. Okay? You kind of have your roots. Oh, goodness. Sorry. If I turn the internet off, then I can't use my pen. So it's, it's a real pain. Right. So whatever, birthdays. Um, your, your roots are uh, what uh, are, of course, nerves that leave the spinal cord. Okay. Then you have this large indentation here anteriorly, and this is known as the um, anterior median sulcus. Remember, a sulcus is where anywhere in the central nervous system where you have a depression, and then a gyrus is anywhere where you have a raise or a bump, right? And then a really, really, really deep sulcus is called a fissure, right? And why does that terminology apply to the spinal cord? Well, because it's part of the central nervous system, right? The brain and spinal cord make up the CNS. And then in the very middle here, you have a little hole, and this is called your central canal. And the central canal is just an extension of the fourth ventricle within the brain. And what, what do we know about the ventricles in the brain? What do they do? What, what's their? CSF. They contain CSF, right? So the, the spinal cord is really an extension of the brain, right? Just like the brain, the middle of the brain is filled with CSF. And then the outer part of the brain is filled with CSF, right? So you have CSF inside and outside. And so the functional part of the brain is protected by a layer of CSF inside and outside, right? So it's kind of a double protection mechanism. The same kind of thing with the spinal cord, okay? Because you have the same meninges covering the spinal cord as you do the central nervous system, the pia mater, the arachnoid, and then the dura mater. You guys cool that? Excellent. All right. Cool. And then right here in this area here is something called the anterior white commissure. And what happens here is you actually have decussation occurring. You have crossover of nerve fibers. And that's important when we um, look at what areas of the spinal cord do what as far as information, the movement information. Okay, so you guys okay there? So now what I've done is I've taken that and I've drawn in color-coded spinal tracts. Okay, these are tracts where specific types of motor and sensory information are going in and out of the spinal cord. Okay, so back here posteriorly, okay, Okay, back here posteriorly, so we're talking about the posterior white column for the most part. This is known as the dorsal column. And this takes sensory information up to the central nervous system. So sensory, sensory information is going up, or ascending, or this is afferent. You guys okay with that? Afferent information is moving up the dorsal or the posterior part of the spinal cord. And this carry, primarily carries information about vibration and proprioception. What is proprioception? Our, our position in space. Or 
good. So the position of your limb or your body or digit or whatever, how is it oriented in space, right? And then, of course, we know what vibration is. You guys okay with that? And this information is ipsilateral. What does that mean? When we say that's ipsilateral information. Same side. Same side. So vibra vibration and proprioception information that is here moves into the spinal cord and goes up on the same side, right? Does, it, does that make sense? Okay. Cool with that? Okay. So now I'm going to move on to an area here. We have it on both sides, okay? And this is a tract that exists right here, or what we call in the lateral white column. And this is known as the corticospinal tract. And these are primarily motor pathways. So back here in the dorsal column is sensory path, our sensory pathways containing vibration and proprioception information. So far so good? Okay. These are motor pathways. These are efferent descending information, right? You guys cool with that? So cortical spinal tracts, motor pathways, and this is also ipsilateral. You guys cool with that? Okay, so the posterior part is ipsilateral sensory information. The lateral parts here are the cortical spinal tracts containing motor information going down and out, and that's ipsilateral. And then finally, we have something known as the spinothalamic tract. And where is this? Where are the spinothalamic tracts located? Good. They're located here in the anterior white columns. But what special structure do we have right here? Well, this is the sulcus here, right, where it goes in. But right there, yes, the anterior white commissure where you have crossover, which means that this information is going to be Opposite. contralateral and not ipsilateral. Does that make sense? Because you get crossover right here. So the spinal thalamic tract is sensory information, mainly pain and temperature. You guys okay with that? Does that, does that make sense? What's going on where? Okay. So the front and the back of the spinal cord contains primarily pathways for sensory information going up to the brain, okay? And then the lateral part of the spinal cord contains primarily motor pathways sending information down to effector organs and muscles, right? And then we have the most significant crossover is ventral or dorsal ventral or anterior, and that are those are your pain and temperature pathways. You guys good with that? All right. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, let's move right along here. Okay. So some additional terminology. When I have a collection of cell bodies within the central nervous system, we call that a nucleus. Okay. And this is just kind of a review from uh, neurology. Remember we talked about the respiratory centers in the pons and the medulla, and uh, those those were uh, sometimes referred to as you know your respiratory nuclei, All right? So anytime you have a collection of cell bodies in the central nervous system, we call those uh, we call that a nucleus. Anytime I have a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, we generally call that a ganglion. You guys okay with that? Okay, cool. So. Again, let's take a look at the spinal cord here, transverse section through it. Okay. So, here I have some sort of sensory receptor. You guys go with that? Let's say that this is a, um, a vibration, okay? There's some vibration, 
and this receptor senses that vibration, and then what does it do? Well, it sends that to the dendrites, right, of a sensory neuron, right? And remember, sensory neurons, what, what kind of neurons are sensory neurons? Afferent. They're afferent, but what kind of neuron? Remember we talked about neuron types in neurology? So unipolar, bipolar, multipolar, pseudo-unipolar. Sensory? Yeah, sensory are. Yeah, what are sensory neurons? They're pseudo-unipolar. Cool, right? And where is their cell body located? So basically it's a long axon, right? And then the body sits off to one side of that axon, right? So guess what? The body of a sensory neuron in, this, in the, um, the peripheral nervous system, the cell body does not live or inhabit the spinal cord of the brain. Does that make sense? Why it would be that way? So instead, the cell bodies inhabit what are called ganglion, or ganglia, when we're talking about them plurally. Does that make sense why you would have a ganglia here? So that information travels via dendrites into the axon, and then it travels along the axon all the way up into the brain. You guys see that there? In the cell body, the soma exists right here in this little bump called a ganglion. You guys cool with that? And interestingly enough, when you look, and again, this is just a review, but when you look at your spinal cord and your spinal nerves, you have what are called roots. You have your dorsal root and your ventral root. And then those roots come together at a spinal nerve, right? So when you look here, you only see a spinal nerve coming out of each side. But if you were to take this away and actually look in, you would see a root come out of the front and out of the back of the spinal cord. And then those roots would recombine to form the actual spinal nerve. And Sensory information comes in through the dorsal roots, the roots toward the back, right? And then that information will either travel through the back or through the front of the spinal cord, right? So those are our two major sensory pathways, right? Or columns, posterior and anterior. And then motor information Okay, motor information, so a motor neuron in the brain, which tend to be multipolar, right? So the information from a motor neuron travels down the axon into the spinal cord, and then you have the axon of the motor neuron that started in the brain right here, and then you have another motor neuron within the spinal cord, right? And so you have the axons, and then they communicate with this other motor neuron, and then that signal passes from the motor neuron in the spinal cord down to its effector organ or muscle. And remember we said that the somatic nervous system is a one neuron system? That means that there is a neuron that starts in the CNS, and carries information all the way to the effector without a ganglion or a synapse or anything like that. Uh, other than the synapse that you have at the effector site. You guys okay with that? And most people would, would say, well, wait a minute. This is a two-neuron system, right? Because I have a neuron here, right? A neuron that starts in the brain and then it ends in the spinal cord and then another neuron begins. So that's a two-neuron system, right? Well, yeah, but when we say it's a one-neuron system, what we mean is a central nervous system. And here's the question. Does this neuron, this motor neuron, begin in the CNS? Yes. 
Sure does, right? Spinal cord's considered the CNS, so that's why we call it a one neuron system, right? You guys cool with that? All right, excellent, excellent. All right. So you guys okay with that? And then within this gray matter here, we also have what are called interneurons. And these are neurons that can pass information and integrate information between sensory and motor neurons. And this occurs in the spinal cord itself. And this gives rise to what? Reflex. Spinal reflexes, right? Now, when I say spinal reflex, do, do I mean deep tendon reflex? No. When we check somebody's deep tendon reflexes, is that a spinal reflex? No. 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 Remember, that information goes, yeah, it goes into the motor cortex, it gets integrated and back down. So what I mean by spinal reflexes are the, those um, rough, um, huh? Yeah, rough protective reflexes. So if you have severe heat or cold and you withdraw from something known as a noxious stimulus, okay, that withdraw is a type of spinal reflex. That's a classic spinal reflex is a withdrawal from pain, right? And you guys have had this experience, haven't you? Um, where maybe you um, put your hand on a sharp object and it cut your hand and what did you do? You pulled away and then what did you do? Ah! What happened? It finally got the spinal hand. reflex. Good. So, this, so, yeah, you actually had integration in the spinal cord, the reflex, and then once the pain information made its way into the brain got down, there was a delay, wasn't there? You did not feel or you were not aware of pain until after the spinal reflex did its thing. That's a weird thing to think about, isn't it? when you really sit and ponder on it, it's like, wow, that's odd. There you go, though. Um, other things that the spinal cord can do is it can, um, it can affect uh, blood vessels as well. You can have vasomotor regulation, and that makes sense that you would want some vascular regulation to occur in your spinal cord, right? Because if I change positions real quickly, I want vessels, like if I... Um, Let's say I lay down and I stand up real quickly, right? I want spinal reflexes to compensate for that and cause constriction of vessels in the lower part of my body to ensure that cerebral perfusion doesn't, doesn't dump, right? Um, sweating, piloerection. Have you guys ever heard that term, pilot? What does that mean? Here. Yeah, that's goosebumps, right? Those kinds of things can all be regulated through uh, spinal reflex arcs. You guys okay with that? All right, cool. All right, moving right along. All right. <clears throat> okay, so this gives rise to a concept known as a spinal cord syndrome. And I don't know how much you guys have talked about these. Have you talked about these in other classes? Advanced class, but not What's that? Advanced the advanced EMT a little bit? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we typically, like with EMTs, basically the... the, the the traditional way of thinking is, oh, you compromise the cord and you have complete paralysis and that's that, right? That's kind of what we, that's kind of the classic way of thinking. But that can't be, right? It just can't be that way, particularly with all the stuff I've already covered today, right? Where you have all of these, these centers and these columns that do specialized things and carry certain types of information. It would make sense that if you only damaged a certain part of the spinal cord, you would have certain deficits. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's what the spinal cord syndromes are. So let's start with the posterior cord syndrome first, okay? And this one, what I want you guys to know about this one is it's actually very rare. Posterior cord syndrome is very rare, okay? But what does it involve? Primarily sensory information, right? What kinds of sensory information? Vibration. Vibration and proprioception. So if you have a damage to the posterior cord, you're going to have a loss of vibration in proprioception, right? And is this ipsilateral or contralateral? Ipsilateral, right? So I'm going to have loss of vibration 
and proprioception on the side where the injury occurs. Or if it's on both sides of the spinal cord, it would be posterior, right? You guys cool with that? Typically, bowel and bladder function is preserved with a posterior cord syndrome, though, okay? So your bowel and bladder function still works, but you have a bilateral loss of vibration and proprioception, okay? Does that make, make sense? All right, good deal. What are some of the major causes of this? Again, it's fairly rare, but disruption of the posterior spinal artery. You basically have two major arteries that give that supply blood to the spine. You have the posterior and the anterior. anterior. Don't think about it too hard. Yeah. All right. And so you need not compromise the spinal cord directly to cause problems. You could simply compromise the blood flow to the spine, right? So you can have a spine injury where you may not have a fracture. You may not have disruption of tendons and ligaments, you may simply have a disruption of a blood vessel that will cause the spinal cord to become ischemic in that area. And that alone can cause a spinal cord injury. You can also have a tumor or an abscess or an infection develop in that area that could cause it as well. Or you could have direct trauma that can cause it as well. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. And another thing to know, what happens following trauma? Inflammation, right? Right, you have inflammation. And the inflammatory response following an injury can cause secondary issues. And remember we talked about primary and secondary injuries with the brain? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The spinal cord is an extension of the brain, so primary and secondary also applies to the spinal cord, where you could have maybe an injury at, um, at C7, right? And then that swelling and that ischemia can rise up the spinal cord and cause problems with areas that were not directly injured. Does that make sense? And this is one reason why it is so important for us to do what when we assess our patients with a suspected spinal injury? Reassess. Continually reassess, right? Is that deficit rising? Is it lowering? Is it changing, right? We want to do serial reassessments of motor sensation, of two-point discrimination, okay, of those kinds of things. Because we want to see how this particular injury is, is, is evolving. Okay, good. You guys go with that? The more common spinal cord sy syndrome is something known as anterior cord syndrome, which is going to evolve an injury to one or more anterior parts, okay? Well, what do we have in the anterior part? Our Good. Well, I have afferent posterior as well, right? And efferent. I have both motor and sensory in the anterior, right? Mm -hmm. I have my motor pathways, which are right here, laterally. And, and then I have pain and temperature pathways anterior, right? Okay, so guess what? you're going to have motor loss, and you're going to have loss of light touch, pain, and temperature. But you'll have preservation of vibration and proprioception, right? So they may not be able to feel pain. They may, they may have paralysis, but they can still sense vibration, and they still can sense where that part of their body is oriented in, in space. Weird, huh? Really, really weird. Okay, good. What are the common causes of this type of injury? Flexion injuries. That's a big cause, flexion injuries. Let me uh, move this thing around here. There we go. Flexion injuries. Okay. What is flexion of the neck? Right? So flexion is good, good. So chin to chest bending over, right? And then extension is back, bending back. Okay, good. So a hyperflexion injury is more likely to cause anterior cord syndrome or a compromise to the anterior spinal artery. And that may be the result of vascular disease. It is possible people that have vascular disease, right? They can have atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis of 
arteries other than their coronaries, right? And remember we talked about like mesenteric ischemia, limb ischemia? Well, you can have spinal ischemia as well, spinal cord ischemia, where you have an atherosclerotic plaque that breaks off, initiates the clotting cascade, and causes total occlusion of the anterior spinal artery. That will cause anterior cord syndrome as well. So it isn't always traumatic. That's the big thing to remember. It isn't always traumatic. There are lots of medical causes. Tumors and abscesses, just like posterior, and something known as aortic cross-clamping. What in the heck is an aortic cross-clamp? Why would you ever do that? Maybe. Think trauma. Oh, trauma? Yeah, why would that be done in a trauma situation? Section. Maybe. Well, yeah, well that, that's the reason a cross, an aortic cross clamp will cause anterior cord syndrome because the anterior spinal artery comes off of the aorta. For sure. So this is a surgical, this is an emergency surgical technique. No. No. Well, uh, you're, you're thinking that those are more like bypass, and you might have cross clamping, but in the trauma context, aortic cross clamp is a procedure that is done by the trauma surgeon, typically, and it is a life saving procedure. So let's say that you have massive abdominal or thoracic injuries, or some abdominal or thoracic injury where you have massive hemorrhaging occurring, okay? It may be very complicated and difficult to open the abdomen, or do we call laparotomy, or a thoracotomy, open the chest, and find exactly where that bleed is and, and pack it and repair it, right? And remember we talked about the concept of damage control resuscitation mm -hmm. or damage control trauma surgery, which the focus isn't on identifying the exact problem. It's what? Stop the hemorrhage, right? Stabilize a patient and then come back at a later time and, re and do revision surgeries. Well, part of that may involve going in and you have massive hemorrhaging. You're not exactly sure where it is or how to repair it. So instead what will happen is they will just go in and they will clamp the aorta above where that bleeding is occurring. Does that make sense? They'll clamp the aorta. Or if the aorta itself is compromised, we can do a cross clamp where you clamp above and below where the injury is, right? You cross clamp it, then you do whatever repair, and then you release the clamps. Well, guess what? Cross clamping aorta can also cause cord syndromes due to ischemia, among other, you know, ischemia to other organs as well. You guys okay with that? And the reason that I threw that in there is, is I've actually had to fly patients who were cross clamped. Why or, do they keep it cross clamped? Uh, it can be quite a while in some cases. Yeah. It's just like applying a really high tourniquet right to your body. Basically, it's 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 a tourniquet to the aorta. Yeah, to the aorta. it's a surgical tourniquet to the aorta. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've had to fly patients. Limbs yeah, limbs, limbs can go uh, a, a couple hours, uh, up to two hours, I believe, when you're talking about orthopedic surgeries. Right. Now, with orthopedic surgeries, what they'll typically do is they'll put a, a tourniquet on the limb itself, right? Right. Yeah, yeah but you're looking at about a two-hour ischemic time for, for an ortho injury, right? Crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I've flown patients where they've... Uh, uh, a stabbing patient and I believe a gunshot. Do they victim. just uh, throw some staples back on real quick, or do they? Actually, what they did clear in both cases, both transports, what they did is they took ring forceps. Oh, okay. Okay, you guys, you, you know your little curve forceps. Well, there's something with a ring, and then they just put three or four ring forceps and close the abdomen, and throw some, throw that was that. Not even gauze. Just leave it open. Yeah, they just like that. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so. This is something you may run into. Okay. You guys go with that? Okay, moving right along. Um, the next injury is what we call a hemicord injury. 
Okay, so this is one section, one hemisphere, if you want to look at it that way. Okay, this is also known as Brown Sequard syndrome. Brown Sequard syndrome, and because it involves three different structures, right? A dorsal, a lateral, and a ventral structure. We're going to have a combination of motor and sensory loss. And some of it is going to be ipsilateral, and some of it is going to be contralateral, right? So the tracks here and here are going to be ipsilateral deficits, okay? So we're primarily talking about ipsilateral motor and ipsilateral sensory in terms of vibration and proprioception, but contralateral pain and temperature loss. Weird. So your patient is going to have loss of pain and temperature on the opposite side of where their spinal injury is, but they will have motor vibration and proprioception loss on the same side. What a weird, confusing picture, right? But it makes sense. It, it, it is. I mean, it's not awesome, no, no, but it's awesome. Like, oh my, yeah. It's 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 just. I I love doing this stuff because it's just just profound realization. Like, wow, wow. Is that that's how it works? One of the most common causes of Brown Sequard syndrome is penetrating trauma. So either missiles, right? Talking about uh, uh, shrapnel, gunshot wounds, those kinds of things objects or um, stabbing. You guys okay with that? All right, moving right along. All right, the next syndrome is what we call central cord syndrome. And this is where the center of the spinal cord gets damaged. And I just want you guys to remember muddy. Muddy. You have bilateral muddy going on. With central cord syndrome, you're going to have more motor deficits than sensory deficits, right? So your motor deficits, you're going to have more significant motor than sensory. And that makes sense, right? Because your motor neurons and your interneurons are synapsing here in the gray matter, right? Whereas your sensory neurons primarily are in the, the white matter, right? Okay. The upper extremities are going to have more involvement than the lower extremities. And the distal parts of the body are going to have more deficits than the proximal parts. And the classic injury that causes central cord syndrome is an extension, a hyperextension injury. And I just think of like that elderly person that falls and lands on their chin and hyperextends their neck. And you get kind of a pulling, tugging on the spinal cord. Okay, that's kind of the classic um, presentation of central cord syndrome. So what causes this? Extension injuries and tumors and abscesses, infections like all the other injuries. You guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we are getting toward the end of the spinal cord syndromes. Hooray, right? And then we'll, we'll um, I still have some more spinal cord stuff to talk about, but this will be a good spot to take a break. Are you guys okay so far? Mm -hmm. Does this make more sense than maybe it did in advanced EMT or AMP or all that? Mm -hmm. And, and I know I take a little time to talk about anatomical and physiological structures that are maybe, you know, beyond what we need to know, but it really helps you understand what's going on when you understand, oh, okay, yeah, the, there's a tract here. And, okay. So the other syndrome is something called kina equina, equina syndrome, rather. Cauda equina syndrome. Uh, I recently had a friend that developed this. Um, he ha had a ruptured disc, actually and developed sudden onset uh, cauda equina syndrome. This is what's known as saddle anesthesia. Okay, And so that means that you have a loss of sensation to your groin, right in here, right, to your groin. That tends to be the result of a disc problem in your lumbar spine, right? If a rupture of a disc, you have significant stenosis, or spondylitis that causes compromise to sensory and sensory, sensory in some cases motor information. But kina equina syndrome, or cauda equina syndrome, I don't know why I can't say that right today, um, 
is sensory, okay? This tends to be the result of disc herniations and spinal stenosis, okay? If you have cauda equina syndrome where you lose bowel and bladder function, okay, this is called conus medullaris syndrome. It is cauda equina syndrome plus bowel and bladder dysfunction. And, the, and one of the classic presentations of this is somebody who has a, a saddle anesthesia and they can't go pee. Like, I can't pee. I can't pee. I can't pee. And that's actually one of the things we ask people that are having back pain. Right? That's one of the questions we should ask them. Are you able to urinate and defecate normally? If they can't, right? Because back pain is a common problem, right? It's a very common problem. So there are some questions that we need to ask, right? And this is a very important one. You know, are you able to urinate? Are you able to poop normally? Because if you can't, guess what? That run-of-the-mill back pain, you know, that guy or that gal who has a history, you know, maybe they're a frequent flyer or whatever, um, guess what? They're now emergent. They are now an emergent patient. That is not someone that someone needs to go to the hospital, and they need to get that area decompressed. Does that make sense? And typically we say um, decompression needs to occur within 48 hours to preserve bowel and bladder dysfunction. Okay, if we do not decompress that, they, they can go on to have um, severe unresolved bowel and bladder dysfunction, which means you know they'll have to have a catheter in for the rest of their life, etc. Okay. So generally, when somebody develops back pain, it's you know you you, you cry about it, and you, you deal with it, and it slowly gets better, right? We've all been there, right? I actually have um, several herniated discs in my lumbar spine, um, and I you know, even had spasms, and I still suffer from um, something called sciatica. You guys familiar with that? Yeah. Right? That's that burning, shooting pain down the sciatic nerve. Right? Some people can even develop what's called foot drop, where you have a loss of motor innervation to your foot, and you cannot... What's that? Flip. Flex your foot. Good. Yeah, you can't flex your foot normally, right? Okay? All that stuff. But if your patient tells you that they cannot pee or poop, that's emergency. It's like, okay, we need to go to the hospital, right? Because you're going to potentially need to have surgery to get that decompressed. Now, unfortunately, surgery may not help with the pain. That's a problem with surgery, with, with back surgery in general. Is it, it's actually not, if you look at the evidence, it's not great. Um, but surgery is very good at preserving neurological function. So preserving function, very good. And then finally, we have a complete transection of the cord, and that results in global deficits. Right? You have complete cord transection. That leads to, obviously, global deficits. And in the next um, lecture, I will talk about specific injuries, injury patterns. We'll talk about neurogenic and spinal shock, and then we'll have a little discussion about um, who gets boarded and who doesn't, and where are we with putting people on long spine boards were definitely not where, where I was 20-some years ago when I started EMS, that's for sure. But we'll talk about that. Go ahead and take a break, guys.